afternoon, everyone. I am Belinda Cheesborough, STEM Education Specialist at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm here to share the stories of African Americans and the impacts they've had and continue to have on American culture because of their STEM contributions. Through the Window and Into the Mirror is a career video conversation series about the experiences of African American STEM professionals today. This time around, we are focusing on innovation, advocacy, and advancement in the field of tech. During our sessions together, students will peer into the windows of their speakers' lives and learn from their lived experiences. They will also find parts of their culture and lifestyle mirrored in their stories. To everyone listening, it is our hope that you leave here with information, inspiration, and plans for action as you take your first steps toward having careers in STEM. This program is generously supported by Dow. Now, let's meet our speaker. Audrey Rose Wooden is an interaction engineer with a focus on educational technology who is passionate about the intersections of technology and storytelling. What this looks like for her is searching for projects that help people communicate with, uh, with each other in new and interesting ways. This could be building a new technology or improving an old one. The goal is that whatever she's working on, it will help people learn more and learn better. She holds a BS from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Comparative Media Studies. She is also a writer and helps her friends execute their creative projects, whether it's self-publishing a novel or making a short film. Finding creative ways to bring her community together and celebrate is her biggest motivation. Welcome, Audrey Rose. I'm so excited to speak with you today while engaging the stu teachers, students, and family of students watching this interview. Now, let's move on to our first question. So please tell us about your work, what you do, and anything else you think is important for us to know. Yeah, hi, I'm really excited to be here today. I'd say what I do for work changes a little bit depending on the role that I'm in. Generally, I'd say I'm an interaction engineer. Usually that falls in like the realm of software development and software engineering. Um, most recently, I've been a front end focused full stack engineer. Um, so every day I'm writing code to create new products that like customers will see, um, which is like super exciting to work on something and build something that real people use in their day to day lives. Cool. So we're going to start off with your childhood and we're going to think back to when you were young. So growing up, did you have interest in STEM? Yes and no. Um, I had interest in parts of STEM. Like, I think I was always really good at and really interested in math. Um, I really enjoyed working with like robots and technology. I wasn't one of those people who did like robot competitions, but um, like Lego sets and stuff like that. I would, I was always building something. Um, my dad was really into woodworking. So we also built a lot of stuff out of wood when we were younger and working on like the mechanical aspect of things. Um, I take apart like toys that I had to try to fix them if they broke. Um, but science not always was like something I was interested in. So some parts of STEM, yes, but not everything. We'll talk about the other interests you had growing up. But I have a question about the woodworking. What types of things would you make on the woodworking table? Yeah, we built so many things. Usually a lot of stuff for like around the house. So we built a mailbox one time, which was really fun. I think the first thing that I remember ever building in like our workshop that we had downstairs was a birdhouse. Um, so then like we built the birdhouse, put it up in one of the trees and like we would fill it with bird seed every day so we could watch like the birds come and go, which was really fun. That's really cool. <laughs> it's awesome that you built a birdhouse and also a mailbox. Like I've I've never done that. I know bird they have like birdhouse building kits. So I I'm pretty sure that's not too hard. But like building a mailbox, that's interesting. Um, so you said that you 
were some like you've dabbled in STEM here and there a little bit, but you also had other interests. But with those like um, experiences you had with STEM, were they positive experiences? And did they somewhat inspire you into the career track that you're on now? Yeah, I think I definitely had some experiences that were positive and some that were less positive. Um, I think I always joked once I got to school that the reason I wanted to be an engineer was because I watched Cyber Chase all the time growing up. Um, and felt like, you know, watching Cyber Chase playing their games online just made me want to be an engineer and to like solve problems and stuff. Um, but really, I'd say the people around me, like my family, my community, they were always like, oh, Audrey Rose, you know, she's really good at math, so she should look at X, Y, Z, um, and really pushed me to, like, expand and, like, be as good at that thing as I could be. Um, I think in school, it wasn't always the most positive experiences. Um, like, I went through the public school system, so they have their own challenges, and they can't always support each student to, like, the best of their abilities, um, or they support them to the best of their abilities, but not the student to their highest standards. Um, so it was definitely more so outside of school that like people were really pushing me to go deeper into STEM for sure. Yeah, what you said actually touches on something I've seen a lot where the negative experiences tend to be in school, depending on the teacher you have or just the curriculum that they have. Whereas the positive experiences are outside of school where you're maybe going to a museum or you're like, you go to this program or something like that, maybe a planetarium even. <laughs> um, and that's where you're like, oh, this is actually cool. So yeah, I hope we could do better about that. So students have positive experiences both in and out of school when it comes to STEM. So that, what you started saying about your family being the big driver for pushing you towards a career in STEM, um, would you say they were a part or the biggest role um, or influence as you were growing up? And did you have other influences or role models growing up? Yeah, I'd say some of my biggest influences and role models growing up were definitely like my parents, my mom and my dad. Um, my dad worked in electronics, so I got to see like that perspective of things. Um, and then I'd say also like my church community was really like big and like influential in like my childhood development. Um, they had a great community and everyone had so many different careers. And like, I remember one of my pastors was an engineer too. And I was like, okay, that sounds really cool. Um, so he doctored when I was finally looking at schools, he talked to me a lot about like what options were available. Um, and then my brothers, I have two older brothers. So just seeing them go through like even like picking what they want to do before I did was definitely also really helpful in me figuring out what it was that I actually wanted to do. Cool, and a very unique situation for your pastor to be one of the people um, who had experience with engineering and is also a pastor so like that was something you could go to like you had all these like little mentors yeah. around you that were kind of guiding you as you were growing up that's really cool I love that so I did say that we were going to talk about this so now we're going to talk about it but you mentioned that you just didn't only dabble in STEM you also dabbled in many other things like the woodworking for instance so what other hobbies and interests did you have while growing up oh my goodness I did everything I <laughs> I honestly did too much at times. Um, so like there was the STEM stuff, there was woodworking. I'm a writer. So like I started writing when I was younger. Um, I, I was a big band kid. So I played like 10 or 12 different instruments. Um, I was involved in everything in school. I was like stage manager for the drama club. I was on the spelling team, the math team. Um, when I got into high school, I was a three season athlete all four years. So I really, I did everything. I was on class council. <laughs> yeah. Very well-rounded student. Is yes. <laughs> Just a perfect sphere. <laughs> that is amazing. So you mentioned um, 
the band part piqued my interest because I also have a history of music growing up too. I was in choir throughout elementary school, high school, and part of college, and even grad school. And I was curious about what your favorite instrument that you enjoy playing when you're involved with band. Okay. I think it depends on what type of music I was playing. Um, mm, okay. I'd say generally speaking, and the one that I've played for like the longest amount of time now consistently is tenor saxophone, um, which is also really fun to Ooh. play in like jazz band. I love jazz music. So like, <laughs> it was a great time. Um, and I'd play that instrument with like a choir that I played in over the summer um, in high school as well. But then for our concerts in high school, I was playing French horn. And I think French horn is like one of those instruments where when you're playing it as a student and you're first starting out, it sounds awful. But then once you start to like really learn it, it like is a really beautiful instrument. And it's one of those ones where like, if you were really into watching movies, like I am, um, a lot of the soundtracks like for Star Wars or like The Incredibles, they use French horn so beautifully where it gave me a greater appreciation for the instrument once I like made those connections because at first it was like, oh, this is hard. But then I was like, wait, no, I wanna be able to play the French horn like they play the French horn. Um, so that was also really fun. That was really cool. I did not know that the French horn was one of the instruments that was part of like the soundtrack for Star Wars and The Incredibles. I, I feel like I need to go back and listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. that's really cool so now moving on to undergrad where did you go for undergrad I went to MIT for undergrad um and if anyone doesn't know because I didn't before I applied there MIT is in Cambridge Massachusetts so just outside of Boston um it's not a fake school I think when I was applying to college I thought a lot of schools like were just used for movies and stuff like Stanford and MIT um, but they're real. Oh, really? <laughs> they exist. <laughs> I could I could see that being considered a fake because they just seem too perfect in the in these different forms of media, right? Like, yeah, I like, thought oh, they were just like, one of those like, things that people like just created a school that like someone really wants to go to. Um, but no, they're real, and like you can actually go there. <laughs> they're real. They're part of the real world, which means they have real world problems too. <laughs> Oh, definitely. And lots of other things. <laughs> oh, that's fun. So you went to MIT. So what did you major in? And what made you decide to pursue that major? Yeah, so ultimately, I majored in comparative media studies. And that's the department at MIT that houses like film, photography, internet studies, as well as our education department, um, specifically focusing on like education technology. I that was my third major at MIT. Um, I started out as electrical engineer, and then everyone told me that no one does just electrical engineering anymore, which isn't true, but they told me that. So <laughs> that department um, is combined with computer science. So then I did electrical engineering and computer science. They try to push you towards that track. Um, and then I realized that I didn't really want to study computer science. So then I went back to just electrical engineering. Um, and then I felt like they didn't really have the support for just electrical engineers. So then I ultimately ended up in comparative media studies and absolutely loved it there. I would assume it's part of your interest in storytelling is what drew you to comparative media studies. Yeah, I think so at MIT, they have a humanities requirement where like everyone has to take like eight classes out of like your entire time at MIT in the humanities. And I realized during my first couple of years that my favorite classes I was taking were actually my humanities classes, not my technical ones. Um, like I enjoy my technical ones too, but I really enjoyed the humanities classes. So I was considering double majoring for a while, but then just sort of dove deep all the way into the humanities and it was a great decision for me I think yeah it's really cool and I respect you for that because humanities weren't always my favorite <laughs> so like I think I was like fully into science like it was just like 
science completely overruled my brain. But I do enjoy um, good media that, like, whether it's, like, written or digital, that really um, communicates science in a beautiful way, in a storytelling way, because I thought people understand that better versus like, oh, this is this and this is how it works. It's not very interesting. So <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely I, I think that being a very useful skill. <laughs> I definitely think it was one of those things where since I was going to a technology school and like I was surrounded by technology all the time, I think the humanities were something that I felt like was missing for me. Like I feel like growing up, I had a nice balance of both. Like we already talked about how I was a pretty well-rounded kid. So like I always did both. Um, so finding a way to get that balance back again um, was really important during undergrad for me. That's beautiful. Keeping well-rounded is always good. I love <laughs> that. So while you were in school, what are some opportunities you took advantage of so far that helped um, that possibly helped towards your current career goals? Yeah, I'd say undergrad was a really interesting experience for me because my school in particular just had so many resources and like so many opportunities available that I had no idea existed until like I stumbled upon them um, or until someone told me about them, which I'm so, so, so grateful for. Like it sort of felt like <laughs> the entire time I was there, opportunities just sort of like fell in my lap where I would just like talk to the right person and they would send me to someone else who just had the exact thing I was looking for. Um, so I traveled a lot, not necessarily out of the country, though I did like have some experiences out of the country, like not study abroad type things, but for conferences. Um, so I started that freshman year and carried that throughout my entire time. Um, traveling on my school's money to go to like tech conferences, specifically black tech conferences. So I went to like the second Afro tech conference, um, which is now much larger, but like I got to see it grow from like something a little bit smaller to something bigger. Got to meet a lot of really cool people there that I still keep in touch with. Um, same thing with like different fellowships for like summer internships. I've had a lot of internships. Um, and I think being able to talk to people who have either worked at those companies before or who did like a similar fellowship before me um, was really great. We have a really strong alumni connection at our school, specifically within like the Black alumni. Um, so being able to talk to them about like not only what it is it like to work at this company, but what is it like to work at this company as a Black person or as a Black woman um, was really helpful for me in like deciding which opportunities I really did want to take advantage of. Um, and then just being in the Boston area in general, like taking the opportunities to get off campus and see how other schools do things and see how like the same projects can be developed like in tandem at like all these different places without talking to each other and then actually connecting everyone together and to get like a better experience for everyone was really cool. Yeah. That sounds really awesome. Especially the idea of like, as you were saying, like the different groups of people who are working on different projects and you're seeing it all kind of coming together as this one <laughs> thing. I, lo I love that. I love that. <laughs> Um, so now we're going to talk about your job. And first thing first, what's your favorite part of your job? I really love like solving problems. Like I think even growing up, like I was always really into like puzzles and logic problems. So I think software development caters to that for me, like trying to figure out what is the best way to solve this like product issue um, and then actually building it is really cool. I think my other favorite part is like shipping products. So actually getting it out into the world for people to see and to use and getting that feedback back and iterating um, and to find the best solution, I think is just like, it's so fun. And it really, it brings me a lot of joy. 
forgot to ask this earlier, but regarding Coda, what um, type of company is Coda? And also like what types of software are you working on that you can talk about? Yeah, so Coda makes docs. Um, their whole thing is about like building things in ways that are right, not familiar. Um, so if you think about a lot of tools that people use like Google Docs or Microsoft Word or like Google Sheets or Excel, like a lot of times we're just creating other iterations of things um, that are really familiar and that's great for user experience and for user adoption, like getting people to use your product. They wanna use things that they already know how to use. Um, but Coda is really trying to flip that on its head and build things that you would use the right way rather than just a, fam a familiar way. Um, so really building from the ground up. Um, yeah, I can't really talk about what I'm working on right now, right now, <laughs> because it will be coming out soon. But yeah, that's that's what we do. It's really cool. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I get that out there in case people aren't familiar with Coda because I was thinking about it and I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. Do people know what Coda is? Very okay. understandable. Yeah. Yeah. But that's really cool. Yeah. I have a friend who also works on stuff and she can't always disclose what she's working on. So it's fine. But yeah. So that was your, your favorite part of the job is being able to basically solve problems. So what is the most challenging part of the job? Is it also solving those same problems? Probably, actually. I think <laughs> it's like a two-parter. Like part of it is also solving those problems because, but I think the root of it is working with other people who have different ideas of how those problems should be solved. Um, I think once you come to an agreement of like, the path forward, like building stuff out. Yes, there are issues, but they're never too difficult or like impossible to solve. Um, but I think that first step of like having a lot of different people working on the same thing who have their own background and their own ideas that they wanna bring in. And like, it's really beautiful, honestly, when it all comes together, but in the moment it can get really intense, um, especially, when working with engineers who like people in STEM in general aren't always known to have the best like people skills or collaboration skills. Like everyone's very individual and like, they're like, this is my project. Like I'm trying to get whatever I need out as soon as possible and in the best way possible and the most efficient way for me. Um, but I think that's also what's been really great about working at Coda is that our entire tool is based on collaboration. So everyone has to be really good or at least open to becoming better collaborators. Um, so it's a really great place to be in that sense. And it makes that part of the job a little less difficult, but I still think it's probably one of the hardest parts of the job. Yeah, I can completely understand that. As someone who's gone through the STEM pipeline and has also been a part of collaborations, um, from regarding my research, it is very much like, I don't know if it's a product of the system where you just feel like you've given a task and you must work on that task and you're the only one that can work on this task. When science is literally, like as we were mentioning before, you have different groups who are working on the project and it's all coming together for this like one objective. And so like, it's that, that collaborative spirit is what makes the project move forward. So. I'm glad that your company is kind of forcing that because that's like literally their whole <laughs> thing. That's right? literally their whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. So now we've talked about your favorite part and the challenging part. Combining them together, what does your typical week look like? Yeah. So I think it sort of depends on what types of projects I'm working on, but generally, at least um, at my company, we work in like one sort of essentially one week sprints. Um, so at the beginning of the week, we all get together and we talk about um, what the priorities are for the particular project that we're working on. So we think about what can we reasonably get done this week? And then what might be like our push goal for the week? So like if everything works out perfectly, what could we strive to do next? Um, and then every day we have a stand up 
where the entire team gets together and we talk about what did you do yesterday? What are you planning on doing today? Is there anything like that's blocking you from getting to like the next step or getting your goal done? And then at the end of the week, we have demos, um, which is basically everyone gets together and they show what they've done for the week, which is really cool to see everyone across the company, like across even different like industries. So it's not just the engineers that are showing, but it's also people in HR who just like created a new guide of how to be more inclusive. And like, it's really cool to see everything that everyone's working on. Um, so I'd say beginning of the week, we set our goals, end of the week, we show what we've done and everything in between, just sort of working through those problems, talking to a lot of different people when you need it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that there's the opportunity to see what other groups are working on and how they're moving forward because then it gives you a better sense of how the whole company is running, right? Basically, um, that's really cool. I really love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so moving on to this question, this is like a past question that we've gotten. So I've been using it again because I love it. So did your family push you towards your current career and what was the impact of that? So I think not really, actually. Um, I think when I was younger, maybe when I was probably four or five, I said that I wanted to be like a baby doctor. And for the longest, my family really held on to that. They were like, oh no, she said she wanted to be a doctor. And I was like, mm, I think I want to be like in middle school, I wanted to be an audio engineer. Um, in high school is when I got into like the electrical engineering part. I think once I got to college and I started studying like electrical engineering, they were sort of like, okay, yeah, we can see that for you. Um, but they never really pushed me towards this career in particular. I would say I have a very large like military family as well. Um, like aunts, uncles, cousins, both of my brothers were all in the military. So that's what they know. So sometimes even when I'm like, oh, when I first graduated, I was like, oh, I don't really know like where I want to work yet or like what types of projects I want to work on. And they were like, well, you could join the military and blah, 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 blah. Um, I didn't, but <laughs> I think that was just their way of knowing that this is what they know. They know that like you'll be taken care of. I think that's what's most important for them is just knowing that I'll be okay. Um, and knowing that I have a plan. So then once I like tell them my plan, they settle it down a little bit more and they're like, okay, she, she knows what she's doing. Um, but they're super supportive of what I'm doing now, definitely. But I wouldn't say they pushed me towards it. That makes sense. I also find it funny that they held on to like your first dream for a really- <laughs> Right? <laughs> it's like, you were like, how old were you? like? probably like five or six or something right no definitely no older than six <laughs> yeah it's like oh she's gonna be a doctor and it's like uh <laughs> maybe wait till maybe wait till Audrey figures out life a little bit more right which is funny because even I think I mentioned earlier that I wasn't always super into science like I love chemistry and physics and stuff but like biology not my thing has never been my thing so I just don't think I was meant to be a doctor <laughs> um yeah I don't think that would have gone well for me <laughs> I I completely agree with you about the biology thing because <laughs> I also wanted to be a doctor when I was younger too I wanted to be a surgeon because I thought dissection was cool um and I was like oh yeah surgery because I love dissection because yeah. that makes sense <laughs> but yeah, no, biology in general is like, yeah, it's not my thing. Physics drew me and chemistry and physics were the ones I enjoyed more. So I totally agree with you about that. Um, but yeah, so another question I have regarding your career is how have you personally, well, this is like a three-part question. So I can repeat any of this if you need <laughs> me to. Um, how have you personally benefited from your career and or success in STEM? How can it be used to motivate the younger generations and even those who are older but interested in moving into the STEM field? Do you have any ideas for easiest first assignment slash project you could think of for youth interested in your STEM field? 
Hmm. Okay. I think the first part was have I personally benefited? No. I think so. I think I'd say as I progress in my career, I've become more confident in what like I'm able to do. I think as I solve more and more challenging issues within the code space, it makes me feel more confident to solve more challenging issues within like an interpersonal space. Um, like if I can figure out how to like write 12,000 lines of code in like three days, then I should be able to have this conversation with this person. And I think that me being more confident in my career and progressing in my career also just makes me a better person to be around because I'm happier with myself and where my career is going. Um, and I think that helps my relationships a lot, which are really important to me. I think like my friendships, my family, like any relationships I have with people are like super, super important to me. So making sure that I can be like my best self and bring my best self to those relationships um, is like, I think one of the most important things on my list. So being better in my career helps me feel better about investing in those relationships um, for sure. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. I love how like you're connecting, um, like being more comfortable with yourself professionally and the work that you're doing, and how like that relates to the in the relationship, as you said, the interpersonal relationships you have, because those are important aspects for you. That's really yeah. I think it definitely started, like I started making those connections back in undergrad because when I first entered freshman year, this person who had just graduated told us like to hold on to the relationships that we had. He said that was really important because like when MIT becomes transactional, so do, so do your relationships. Like whether that's worrying about whether or not you can pay for school or what worried about whether or not you can finish your assignment on time or like how your grades are going. Anytime more of your brain energy is focused in like a different aspect of your life, something else will suffer. Um, so making sure that like I can try to do as well in all the other aspects of my life so I can invest the proper amount of time that I want to in the things that really bring me joy and like really like fill my cup and fill my soul is like super important. Um, and that sort of like guides a lot of like the decisions that I make career-wise and like also just out in life really seems like a word that perfectly describes you as balance I try like <laughs> yeah <laughs> not saying not saying that you always have perfect balance but like that is a goal or like that's just part of who you are as a being like you just want balance through everything yeah. I think like it's through your interests and, yeah yeah I'd say balance or yeah, I think balance is the exact word to describe it is what I'm always striving for. Um, so I don't have to like let go of any other, any part of myself. I think it's really important to like be able to bring my full self to every part of my life, whether that's professionally or personally. Um, and trying to find that balance is definitely what I'm looking for and trying to maintain. I would, I would say that that's something a lot of people are. <laughs> yeah. working on too so you're not alone in that aspect um but the second part of that question asks how can it be used so like the things you benefited from how can they be used to motivate the younger generations and even those who are older but interested in moving into the field of stem yeah i think something that i've learned in at least up until this point is that we all can do this work <laughs> um, which i think is really important because sometimes we feel like we cannot and it's not that you can't um there are definitely things that you can do better and then there are things that you don't do as well um but we can all do this work and i think that the ways that like 
interviews are structured or the ways that programs are structured, it sometimes makes you feel that you can't. That's not really it. Um, so I'd say if you want to, you definitely can, and you can make that happen. Um, I think I don't believe in any of like my decisions being like right or wrong. Like there are some things that are just like right or wrong, but I think a lot of the decisions that I've made, like I had, like I came to a crossroads and I chose one way. Um, and either decision would have been fine. It's just like a different outcome and like I've become like a different version of myself that like I wouldn't have become if I went a different way and that way I would become a different version of myself that isn't better than like who I am now it's just a different version um and I think that in STEM there's also a lot of options like that I think there are things that break like your systems um but there are always a lot of different options and sometimes one option is easier sometimes one option is like has an optimal performance, but like there are always those options. Um, I think if you can see those options, like if you go through life and you can see options, then I think that you would really excel in a lot of fields of STEM um, because a lot of what STEM really is, is just making decisions and then going with that decision and following through. I feel like a lot of us, we have the qualities necessary. Um, it's just like getting into it and starting and learning um, what they expect you to know, which isn't as difficult um, once you've like set your mind to it that you're going to do something. Exactly. Exactly. And the last part of that question is do you have any ideas for easiest first assignment slash project you could think of for the youth interested in your field of STEM? Hmm. So I'd say, I think it depends on what part of my field of STEM you'd be interested in. I think for me, I've definitely always been drawn to like the more front end aspect of things. So like thinking about what people see on a page. So like something as simple as I go to a website and there was something like getting to a certain part of the website was really difficult. Thinking through different ways that would have made that easier for me to get to the end point that I arrived at. Like if I had to go through three different pages to get the answer to my question, how could that have been easier? Like maybe I could add a search bar, maybe we could, like in the menu, add drop down tabs and like starting small, even like getting a piece of paper and sketching that out is a really great place to start. And then once you're there, once you've gotten to that point, I think the next step is like drawing it out like digitally. So there are a lot of different tools like Figma, for instance, is really popular. Um, or like if you have, um, like a tablet if you're on Procreate. I love like sketching out stuff on Procreate and like trying to make it as like clear and clean and crisp as possible. And then after that, it's like actually building it out. So like there are a lot of different websites that you can use um, as like documentation of like how to build things. There's um, Like the hour of code little tasks are really cool. I don't know if they still operate, but I remember back in high school, like we used to always do every year, we had the hour of code and it was like this huge thing. So I'm certain that they at least still have a website up that you could see. Um, but any of those types of like challenges where, or like a 50, you set out like a, a 10 day challenge or a 20 day challenge or a 30 day challenge where each day I'm gonna like code up a small feature and then eventually, once you made all those small features, they turn into bigger features, or you can connect them and make like something more complex. So I think just starting small and being like, oh, I want to learn how to build a search bar. I want to learn how to build a menu. I want to learn how to build a profile page. Um, and I think sometimes if you're building out those small things, and you're building stuff that you wouldn't use every day, it can get really discouraging because why am I building why am I building 
a flight simulator when I don't like airplanes. Like, I think it's important to enjoy what you're building. So like, once you learn the basics, trying to build out stuff that like you would use or that your friends would use, um, because it's really cool once you like finish a project and you're like, yeah, I'm going to have my friends over and they can test it out for me. And they can tell you how cool you are that you built this thing that they all want to use. And if it breaks, that's also okay because it's another part of the process and now you get to fix it and then get to that same point. So, yeah. Exactly, very iterative thing. Like working on it, testing it out, breaks. Okay, let's fix it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So uh, lessons learned is just start small, start where your interests lie. Mm -hmm. and use the resources you have around you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's move back to your life outside of work. So you've told us that growing up, your family and your friends and even just like people in your community were like the biggest biggest influences growing up. So as now, now you're a full-fledged adult, <laughs> do you have any um, newer role models or influences or have you pretty much it's pretty much stayed like your family and your immediate community yeah I'd say my influences from growing up are definitely still like really strong influences today um but I definitely have added some more I'd say I have two like main mentors that I've gained and built relationships with throughout like my time in undergrad and still today um one of them graduated from MIT in 2011. One of them graduated from MIT in the 90s. They're so cool. <laughs> and I think they're just like people where like, I would want to be that type of alumni when I'm older. Um, so I think in that way, they've been really helpful. Um, and per in particular, the one who graduated in 2011, he was 10 years ahead of me. So it was like this really cool like dynamic of like, oh, you're 10 years out. I'm just starting like what's going on. Like the exact 10 year gap was like really cool to both of us. Um, and like when I was out in San Francisco for one of my internships, he was living out there at the time. So like he would bring me around, introduce me to like the other MIT alum that were in the area. And they were just like all really cool people that were like finally getting established in their careers. Like I'd still say I'm pretty much still at like the start of my career. Like I have a lot of different options of ways I can go, but they were really getting established. Like they had just gotten to the swing of things, learning how to be like a real adult, like <laughs> learning what they do like in a company, what they don't like in a company um, and getting up like the career ladder. Um, so getting to see them at that point and know that that will come and that like, I don't have to be there right now. They definitely reassured me that like, there's still time to get to that place. So I would say to everyone, there's still time to get to this place. Even I like, don't really feel like I'm somewhere where like, like I'm not at the pinnacle of my career yet. And I'm very okay with that. Um, I'd actually really prefer to not be because I have so many years ahead of me. And if I was at the pinnacle of my career right now, like where else would I go? So I'm really looking forward to like the upward trajectory and they help me like see where that can be, but stay grounded in where I am right now as well. So, so much more room for growth and amazingness to happen. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're just at the beginning of it. Yeah, which is like so exciting to be. Yeah. Okay, oh, I can't believe that there's only two more questions left. Well, a few more questions left. So this one is we're back to your hobbies. Now I know that now that you have a full-time job, you've had to probably cut down on <laughs> a lot of the hobbies you first took in as a kid. Um, but what are some of those hobbies that you still um, involve yourself with to this day? And do you uh, have any new hobbies? <laughs> You would think I would cut down on them, but who knows? <laughs> I still do a little bit too much, but I've definitely cut down on them a lot. I'd say, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I was a really big reader as a kid. Like I lived in the library. Um, 
but now I basically have a library of my own in my own home. So that's great. Um, so I read a lot of books. I write a lot still to this day. Um, I really enjoy like walking along the water. I don't know if this counts as a hobby. I just really enjoy anything related to water. So like, I like taking walks along the water. I like, like going on boats or paddle boarding and stuff. Um, I'm a runner. So I ran cross country in high school. Um, so I still run now. Um, what else do I do? Oh, I make my own candles. That's really fun. I love candles. So I started making my own because I only really like like fruity or like summer scents. And you can't buy those. And like really even now everything is fall scents, even though it's still August, right? Um, I don't really like the fall and winter scents. So I started making my own so I could have the scents that I wanted in my house all year long. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I do other things too, probably. But those I think things. the better question is what do you not do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like candles? Oh my God, that's so cool. <laughs> like, I just, I really, I see things that I want to do and like, I just do them. Um, which like, I'm really grateful that like, I have them in a position where I can do that. I'm like, oh yeah, I could do that. And then I do it. Um, it's, it's really great. I like it. Oh, I'm really into, I haven't really done anything with it yet, but I'm really into like interior design. So like I'm in the planning stages for like a remodel right now, which is cool. Um, and then I love to travel. I traveled a lot as a kid as well, but like mainly in the States. And then like we had some family out of the country, so we go visit them. But like I've traveled much more since undergrad and like much, much more since like getting a full-time job where like I can afford to travel on my own now. Um, so I just, I like to see the world and see how other people live. It's really great. So I have, I had one question. Mm -hmm. It was regarding woodworking because you didn't mention it, but I was curious if you still do some woodworking or did that kind of like, is that one of the activities that kind of got paired off? So not regularly, but that was mostly because um, I haven't really had access to like a shop or anything or like wood. I guess I would have on campus, but like I was, just, I was doing a little bit too much on campus. Like I was always doing something. Um, I was really active in like our Black Student Union and advocacy on that front. So like, um, I like really had to choose like what things I wanted to do so I could also do well in my classes at the same time. But I do have a plan for like a coffee table that I want to build. I want it to be like like a Scrabble coffee table but like with another insert on top so I can like do puzzles too. I've just been trying to like figure out ways where I can like play games and like make puzzles together, but like not take up all of the services in my home. So like I'm, I'm in the planning stages for that now, but my dad and I are, are planning on making that probably within like the next six months or so. That, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I can't wait to see that. I hope I get to see at least a picture of that. At some yeah, point. I'll send a picture. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. <laughs> Whenever it comes to fruition, that's really cool. I did have a comment about the water thing because I just visited my friend in Wisconsin and we took a walk to Lake Michigan. And this, like, I totally understand the feeling of just wanting to be near water. It's just that very healing atmosphere to be around. Yeah, it's really grounding. And I think like it was one of those things that was like always true for me. Like when we were growing up, we always went to like the ocean. I've lived on a coast like all my life. So, and then like I did internships where I was on the West Coast or like I did one summer where I was like in the Caribbean. So like I've always been near like a large body of water. So it's like really important to me. Um, and I've been like really grateful to have that access because I don't know how people in like landlocked states do it. I really don't. Like <laughs> me not being able to go to the water just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but then when I was in school, actually cross-registered and took some like liter black literature classes at Harvard and like learning about like the history and like 
spiritual connections and just like historical connections of water and like black people and like that connection with like our writing as well is like super cool like Langston Hughes has an entire poem about rivers and being like like my body speaks of rivers uh, my soul has grown deep like rivers so just like water is like so cool to me um, I write a lot about water now too after learning about that that was really cool and I feel like you would need like a whole another 30 minutes or an hour to talk even just about that so <laughs> save that for another day <laughs> but that was really cool so now we're coming towards the end so we have just a couple questions left um first of which is my favorite question to ask but um what does black slash african-american representation in data slash tech mean to you to me, it's everything because I think particularly being in the field that I'm in where I care about the user experience and I care about how people are using these products, having people that look like me working around me, one, it's great for me. Like it's a much better experience for me to be able to look out and see other people that look like me in the office or like across the Zoom screen since I'm working remotely right now. But it's better for the products. Like I hate using it as like a business objective or being like, oh yeah, it's better for business. But like the research has been done. It is better for business. But more importantly for me, it's better for the users who use these products. So when they have representation, and the people who are building the product, their needs and their concerns and their cultural nuances are being taken into account. Even if it doesn't end up being the, like someone's suggestion isn't the one that we go with, just having that voice at the table, though like having the voice at the table and never going with what they say isn't enough, but I definitely think it's a start. And it's one of those things that makes me feel like, it's more likely to be listened to. It makes me feel like it's more likely that we'll find products that are being built more ethically, that are being built in ways that like actually take into account what we care about using and what we care about doing. Um, and then also this field in particular, like most STEM fields, but like software engineering in particular, I think is definitely one of the quickest ways to like start building wealth in our communities in ways that like you can pour it back into your community. You can start like, I think that when there's more representation in tech of black voices, everyone like black or otherwise, everyone benefits from it. Um, yeah like you can make a lot of money here too which is like also really cool just for yourself for your family building that generational wealth if that's something important to you um closing the wealth gap if that's something that's important to you so i think that's also definitely something to mention all those things are very true very true and my final question is what advice do you have for members of our audience particularly the middle schoolers to high schoolers who are thinking about the greatest things in life. Um, what, what advice do you have for them who want to follow your particular path? Yeah, I'd say now more so than even when I was in your position or when my parents were in your position, you have more options available to you. Like, as much as I would recommend staying in school, going to school, getting your degree in computer science or whatever, if this is something that you want to do, you have so many options now. There are boot camps. There are, like, you can major in something completely different and then pivot into this career. Like, you, I'd say more than anything, should explore all of your options. I, I would never get too tied to one outcome because 
there are so many things that I didn't even know existed before I got to school. Um, like so many, we have like 20, <laughs> MIT had like 20 different types of engineering that you could major in. I had no idea. And if I didn't give myself the grace and space to look into each of those and see if there was something else that I would have wanted to do, I never would have stumbled on the major that I ended up picking. And I don't think I would have had as great of a time, as great of an experience if I stuck with what I said I was going to do at the very beginning. So I'd say flexibility is something that I would value if I were you in your position. Um, because you have so many options and you have so much time ahead of you. I know it can feel really daunting of like, oh, high school is coming up or college is coming up and I need to do this. I need to do that so I can get into a good school so that I can do this thing that I really want to do. Because if I don't do that, then like my entire life is like meaningless, but like, that's not true. <laughs> it's like really dangerous. I know it's really easy to say for me now, since I've been through all of that and that it feels very real and it is very real in that moment but giving yourself space and grace and flexibility, I think is really important. And just trying things. Like if you wanna try something, then try it. If you wanna do something, then do it. And if it doesn't work out, that's okay, do something else. Um, and you have time and yeah. Well, Audrey Rose, thank you for your time for sharing your story with us and for giving us insight into the world of tech. To everyone watching, thank you for spending your time with the National Museum of African American History and Cultures through the window and into the mirror, a career conversation series. Thank you all for your participation and please remember, history is made by doing ordinary tasks extraordinarily well over long periods of time. Thank you very much, stay safe and have an amazing weekend. Bye-bye.